The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. A couple of comments about the test. You should have got your test back yesterday. And uh, here's the, uh, the way things panned out. We had a class average of about 77. I said, settle down. Perhaps you think you've come to math or physics. This is 3091. We have standards here. So 77 is class av. The uh, standard deviation was 17. And uh, so you can see where things uh, lie. Uh, 50 is a pass. So uh, congratulations. A lot of uh, people uh, put in the effort, and there's some learning going on. Uh, I, well, I, at the same time as I say congratulations, I want to remind you that I think it comes as no surprise, given the um, lateness of Labor Day this year, that this first test came rather early. And for many of you, much of this material you'd seen in high school. Uh, perhaps the data rate was a little bit faster than you were accustomed to, but you had some familiarity. Uh, please don't, if you're up here, become complacent, uh, because a month from now we'll have a, another uh, test, and uh, I think you, you'll wish that you were continuing to make the investment in time. Uh, if you're down here, uh, what I want you to do is uh, uh, talk to somebody. Talk to either your recitation instructor, come in and talk to me, uh, we will provide tutorial assistance at no charge if you want to uh, amplify the uh, exposure to uh, question and answer. Uh, all you have to do is contact uh, either Hillary or Laurie at my office and we'll arrange for uh, tutorial uh, meetings. Um, and um, you know, maybe down here you, just, you got rattled, maybe you uh, uh, weren't feeling too well that day, maybe you have to bone up on your test taking skills. Uh, I don't care what, what the score is down here at the, at the moment. Uh, as I told you uh, on the first day, I do look at trends. And so uh, let's, let's make every effort to take the steps necessary to master that material and move forward. The good news is that we're going to be shifting gears very soon and moving into subject matter unlike anything you've seen in high school. And so you'll get a fresh start. So I don't want anybody feeling that if he or she is down here that it's, uh, it's hopeless at this point. It is not. Quite the contrary. And I've actually seen uh, evidence over the years, mercifully, uh, just a small amount of evidence, but there are, in a group like this, always a few students who come in with a really strong background in high school. They do uh, extremely well on the first test and conclude that chemistry is in the, in the bank and they can focus on the other subjects. And little by little, they start creeping down here. It happens. So um, the model solutions will be posted, as, uh, as I told you. And uh, we pride ourselves in giving you a rapid return, but there's a trade-off, and that is we're going to make some mistakes. The mistakes are not indelible. You can come in uh, and have your grades uh, adjusted. First thing you do, please talk to your recitation instructor. If the recitation instructor feels that there was um, an oversight, uh, then the recitation instructor will recommend that you come and see me, and uh, I will change the grade. Um, if it's just an addition error, the recitation instructor has authority to, to, to uh, make that adjustment. Um, and you don't all have to go stampeding down to my office right away. You can adjust those grades. Let's, let's, leave, it till, uh, let's leave it till next week, and uh, we can take it at a leisurely pace. Um, but there's no time limit on it. In fact, you can be sitting three years from now waiting before commencement, and you can get that grade adjusted. I can adjust the grade right up until the moment you get your degree. After that, the records are sealed. So the reason I tell you this is that I don't want people feeling that, well, if you know, the, the, the paper is going to start to decompose or something if, if I don't get to him by 5 today. So don't, don't uh, hurt yourself in, in the stampede to my office. Okay, um, so congratulations again to those that did well. And uh, let's, let's do what we can to get uh, everybody over to the right of that blue line. Um, and uh, just to keep the rhythm going, uh, we will have a test on uh, Tuesday, the weekly quiz. And I know it's only the third quiz, but I like to keep the quiz number the same as the homework number. So Q4 covers homework four. Otherwise, there's some confusion later on. 
Um, so last day, uh, Professor Ballinger introduced you to uh, Lewis, who taught us that octet stability could be achieved via electron sharing as an alternative to electron transfer, and he coined the term covalent bonding. It means cooperative sharing of valence electrons. That's what gets uh, crunched down a covalent bonding. Powling came along later and uh, told us that the electrons are not shared equally. And this was important because there were problems in computing the bond energies of heteronuclear molecules. If you looked at heteronuclear molecules, you wanted to compute the bond energy, you might start with the bond energies of the two constituents. And you'd find that the bond energy of the heteronuclear molecule was nowhere on the average of the two. And that didn't make sense. If I have one that's 400 kilojoules per mole, another is 200 kilojoules per mole, and I blend them, how do I get 500 kilojoules per mole? That bothered people, and Pauling came along and said, the unequal sharing of electrons in a covalent bond can explain that extra energy, and he, termed the term, uh, he coined the term polar covalency. And in particular, he introduced a quantitative measure. You see, this is why he gets the Nobel Prize, and Lewis did not get the Nobel Prize, although Lewis did brilliant work, but Pauling's work was quantitative. He introduced the concept of electronegativity, which was a measure, therefore it's quantitative, a measure of the atom's ability to attract electrons within a covalent bond and developed a scale of electronegativity. And uh, that's shown here. And this looks a lot like the average valence electron energy, doesn't it? Where the lowest values of electronegativity are in the metallic zone and the highest values of electronegativity are in the non-metallic zone. And think about it, if this is a measure of the ability of an electron to be pulled in a covalent bond, so if I have H here and F here, and F is more electronegative than H, and so the electrons, instead of being shared equally, I'm going to show them over here. As if to say, fluorine is hogging the electron. It makes sense. If this is metallic, it's a good electron donor. Well, if it's a good electron donor in an electron transfer reaction, if the same element finds itself in a covalent bond, it's going to be a good electron donor, although it's not full transfer. And likewise, the element that's a good uh, electron acceptor in an electron transfer reaction is going to be the element that's going to hog the electrons in a covalent bond. So there's some consistency here. And you see where the most uh, electronegative elements are, and fluorine is the most electronegative of the active elements. I know neon has a higher yet electronegativity, but normally it is inert. So um, how do we use this electronegativity? Well, uh, I mentioned to you that there was this mystery, so let's go back and review one of these. This is the um, uh, homonuclear bond energy for hydrogen in pure hydrogen. So there we have perfect covalency. Both hydrogens are going to share equally. We don't have two different species of hydrogen here. So the electrons are perfectly shared, and this turns out to have a bond strength of 435 kilojoules per mole. And likewise, if we look at fluorine in its diatomic molecule, it's 160 kilojoules per mole. And yet the bond energy in HF, the bond energy in HF Just so that we're clear, this is the bond in this compound. As we'll see a little bit later, I could talk about the carbon-hydrogen bond in methane where there is a plurality of bonds. In this case, there's only the one bond, but I just want to get the formalism. So this is the HF bond in HF. It's nowhere on this interval. And this is what puzzled people. It's 569 kilojoules per mole. So there's something extra going on. And so what, what Pauling gave us was a formula. So he said if you take an XY, the XY bond energy, XY bond energy starting, starting with the bond energies XX and YY bond energies, this is how to make sense of it. What Pauling taught us was that the energy of the XY bond is equal to the average yeah, we're going to start with the average. That's a good place to start. And he defined the average in terms of not the sum divided by 2, but he chose the geometric mean. So you take the product 
the square root of the product. And in, in fact, there are some very old books that show this as the, the average, the sum divided by two arithmetic mean, but the modern practice is to use the geometric mean. And then he said there's a second term here, a contribution to the unequal sharing, and to measure the uh, intensity of unequal sharing, we take the difference in electronegativity, which I'm going to use the Greek symbol chi for. This is lowercase chi, so I'll take chi x minus chi y, and the functionality, it goes as the square of the difference in electronegativity, and the prefactor is 96.3 when you want to get a result in kilojoules per mole. So let's go through this calculation for uh, HF. If we look at 435 times 160, take the square root of that, we'll end up with 264 kilojoules per mole, which sensibly lies between these two values. And then this second term, we go to the periodic table, we'll find that the value here for hydrogen is 2.2 and the value for fluorine is 3.98. You plug all of this in and you get 344 kilojoules per mole, which then sums to 608. Now, 608 is not 569, but remember, this is very uh, rough estimate. But the, 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 the beauty in this calculation is it shows that this concept of electron uh, sharing in an unequal manner is sound and it, and it gets you into the right ballpark. And so um, Pauling went further and he said, this is the purely covalent component. This is purely covalent because all it is is homonuclear bond energies. Homonuclear means both, both uh, elements in the molecule are the same. They, instead of, there's no homo elemental, they say homonuclear. All right, so this is purely covalent. And what's this? He said this is partial ionic character. Partial ionic character. Why did he choose that term? Well, I like to think of it as I've got this sort of uh, a sharing meter. And I'll give you the extremes. So if I look at a homonuclear molecule, such as a uh, molecular hydrogen, this is perfect sharing. So if this is my sharing meter, this is electron sharing, electron sharing meter. It's right at 12 o'clock, all right? Now, if I get over here, HF, I know that the fluorine is hogging the electron, so it's not equal sharing, it's over here, all right? So this is, this is pure covalency. This is pure covalency. This is polar covalency. Well, why did he call it polar covalency? Because if you look at this molecule, you say that, well, the electrons are a little bit closer to the right than to the left, so the charge isn't uniformly distributed. It's net neutral, the molecule is net neutral, but this right end is a little bit more negative, and the left end is a little bit more positive. And in physics, when physicists want to say a little bit of, the physicist writes lowercase delta. That's physics talk for a little bit of. So this is a little bit negative and this is a little bit positive, which means I could model this by drawing a dipole. This is a dipole. It's got a negative end and a positive end, and it has certain properties. If we put a dipole that has the freedom to move, we put that dipole in an electric field, it will align itself with the field lines. Okay? So because this is a dipole, he chose the pole part of dipole to give us polar covalency. And what's the ultimate? What's the, t what's the extreme of, of unequal sharing? It's, une it's electron transfer. So this is perfect sharing, unequal sharing, and here the electrons are, are actually donated. So this becomes F minus. This is denuded of an electron. It's Na plus. And so this one here, I'm going to say, let's bury the needle on this one, okay? This is, this is the ultimate in unequal sharing, and this is ionic, right? This is ionic bonding. So you can see that polar covalency is a tendency towards ionic bonding, and that's why Pauling called this partial ionic character. And uh, he actually quantified it. He quantified it by this formula. He said that the percent ionic character, and this is within a bond, not for a compound, this is percent ionic character for a covalent bond, for a covalent bond. He said that's going to equal 1 minus the exponential. This is just uh, base E, 
natural logarithm, e to the power of minus one quarter times the difference in electronegativity squared. So it's this uh, thing again. You see the difference in electronegativity? Square it, multiply it by a quarter, and raise that to the power e, subtract that from one, multiply it by 100, and you have something between 0 and 100. And uh, I think there is some uh, evidence of that here. So this is right off your periodic table. If you look up in the corner of your periodic table on one of the sides, uh, they've actually tabulated this for you. So I've rewritten the formula here. And these are, there are two different um, uh, scales of ionic character, one by Pauling. Actually, there's more than two, but they, they show these two. There's Pauling, there's Hanna and Smythe. And so here's Pauling. And um, we, could, we could do this for um, our, our compound here, HF. For HF, just for grins and chuckles, let's do it. The electronegativity of fluorine is 3.98, and the electronegativity of H is 2.20 on this scale. And so if you plug these values into this formula, that will give you that the percent ionic character for the HF bond. And see, I want to make sure that you don't think that this is the percent ionic character of the compound. So I'm going to be really fastidious here and indicate that I'm talking about the HF bond. If you uh, plug into this formula here, you end up with 56%. Um, and that's already been tabulated up there in the nomograph. You'll see if you get, uh, I think the delta here is 1.78, which is roughly 1.8. And there you see the 56. Now, how does that, just to give you a sense of what that means, if the 264 figure is pure covalency and the 344 is partial ionic character, what fraction of the 608 is 344? 344, which is partial ionic character, divided by 608 times 100 uh, is 57 percent. So it makes sense. It makes sense. So that's good. We can do all sorts of things with this thing. Uh, so I, I indicated the molecule. There's, there's another uh, uh, orthography that's used to indicate dipole. You can use delta minus, delta plus. Some people like to use an arrow, and the arrow points in the direction of the more electronegative end. And the way I remember that is I put a little cross here, and then I make that the plus end. I don't know. You, you can have your own mnemonic device to figure that out. But anyway, so let's, let's go on and look at another one. I think last day Professor Ballinger did, uh, did this one. He did some hybridization methane, all right? So here's methane. Methane looks like this with the sp3 hybridization. So let's, let's look at that one. See, here we've got a dipole. We only have the one bond, so the actual HF molecule HF molecule is polar. HF molecule is polar. It has a net dipole. Whereas H2 is nonpolar. H2 nonpolar. How do I know? Its charge distribution is perfectly symmetric. The electrons here are shared equally. So that's nonpolar. And likewise for fluorine, F2. So let's look at uh, methane. So methane we can draw. It looks like this. We've got carbon. SP3 hybridization, right? CH4 is SP3 carbon hybridization. So it allows four bonds to form instead of just two. And so now I've got hydrogens at the four corners of a tetrahedron. So now I want to ask, what's the nature of the carbon-hydrogen bond? What's the nature of the carbon-hydrogen bond? And I look up and I see that the electronegativity of carbon is 2.55 and the electronegativity of hydrogen, we already know, is 2.20. So there's a difference in electronegativity. And since carbon's electronegativity is higher than that of hydrogen, which you'd expect from where carbon lies on the periodic table. Think about it. See, if you know the periodic table, then you know where re relative elements, where elements are relative to one another. So at any moment, you know in any bond which is the more electropositive. Electropositive is down to the left, because that's where the metals live. So carbon is to the right of hydrogen. This is more electronegative. So let's look at this carbon-hydrogen bond. What's that tell you? It tells you that it's, first of all, there's polarity here. The electrons are not equally shared, and the carbon hogs the electrons a little bit more 
than the hydrogen. So the carbon is electron rich and the hydrogen is just a little bit electron deficient. So now the question is, um, well, first of all, let's get that down. Let's show that carbon-hydrogen is polar. It's a polar bond. This is delta minus, and this is delta plus. So I have a polar bond. Here's the question. Is methane a polar molecule or a nonpolar molecule? So let's look carefully. How do I answer that question? I have to ask, is there a net dipole? So let's look carefully here. All four of these hydrogens are electron deficient in the same manner. So where is the center of net negative charge in this molecule? The center of excess negative charge on all of the dipoles is at the very center of the molecule. Where is the center of the excess positive charge? And by here I mean it's, it's net neutral, but the uh, electron deficiency. Can you see that the centers of electron deficiency lie on a sphere equidistant from the center? So where is the center of the delta minus? The center of the delta minus is the center of the molecule. So now that means that if this is where the center of positive excess charge lies, and on top of it is the center of negative excess charge, there is no displacement of the charge, so there is no net dipole. No net dipole. And so methane is nonpolar. It's, a, it's an, a, an aggregate of four polar bonds, but they're symmetrically arranged in space. So symmetric disposition of polar bonds still results in a nonpolar molecule. So we can say that a nonpolar molecule you can have as a result of two conditions, two different conditions. Nonpolar molecules result from either. It's one or the other. One is the trivial case is homonuclear. If it's homonuclear, they're all the same, they all share. Homonuclear species. Homonuclear species. So, for example, H2, N2, they're going to share the electrons uniformly, equally. And it goes when you have phosphorus, P4, S8, all of these multi atomic moieties are nonpolar. The second way to have something that is net nonpolar is to have spatially symmetric, spatially symmetric disposition of polar, disposition of polar bonds. So a good example of that is CH4, because the CH bond is polar, but it's symmetrically disposed in space. Okay, good. So now I want to look at the energetics. I haven't, I haven't uh, um, talked about it from a graphical standpoint. We looked at it from an analytical standpoint. So let's go back and look at it um, from an energetic standpoint. There's too much talking in the room. So I'm asking you to stop now in respect for your classmates. I don't like the rudeness. I want it perfectly quiet in here. There's no compromise on that. None. When you walk through that door, it's an act of free will. And I will not have anything other than complete silence. It's not fair to the classmates to have to listen to conversation. So now let's look at let's look at the energetics graphically now. I want to go back to our energy level diagrams. I want to look at energy level diagrams. And, uh, and see if I can rationalize energy level diagrams. But now, not for single atoms. I want to do energy level diagrams for molecules. So that's different. So where am I going to get those energy levels from? I get the energy levels from the Schrodinger equation. The Schrodinger equation, the Schrodinger equation will give us, give us the energy levels in molecules. We, we saw this Schrodinger equation for atomic hydrogen, but you can write it for more complex systems, and it is, it is horrible. It is horrible. But there's good news. The Schrodinger equation is linear. The Schrodinger equation is a linear equation. 
And this is one of the times when you're actually going to be able to use some of that math they teach you. What is one of the properties of a linear equation? A linear equation means that solutions are additive. Solutions are additive. So, for example, if I have an equation that looks like this, f of x, y, z, I might as well do it x, y, z, because we're talking about something that's going in three space. Suppose f of x, y, z equals k1. That's my equation. And it has a solution, gives me a solution, s1. And I have another equation, f of x, y, z. So this is the same equation, the Schrodinger equation, only it's got different boundary conditions. It's got k2 as the boundary conditions. And when I solve it for k2 boundary conditions, I get s2. Here's the power of linearity. The power of linearity is if I come across f of x, y, z equals k1 plus k2, if it's a linear equation, I don't have to go and solve it all over again. Instead, I can write with impunity the solution will be s1 plus s2. And that saves a lot of time. Linearity is the desirable way to go if you can manage. So, and if you want to say, so what does this mean? Linearity of solutions, the elegant way of saying it is superposition holds. Superposition holds. And that's what people are going to use. They're going to say, well, what's the solution? I said, here's a solution, S1. What's the solution to the Schrodinger equation? The solution to the Schrodinger equation is C. It's a wave function. Okay? So what we're going to say is that the wave function, the wave function for molecular orbitals is going to be the sum, it's going to be an additive sum of the wave functions of atomic orbitals. So I'm going to sum up the atomic orbitals that go into the molecular orbital, and it's, they're going to have some coefficients. All right. So we're going to have coefficients on this, and they'll add up. And then we're going to construct molecular orbitals. And the technique is called, and watch this, this is a six-letter initialization, six letters, linear combination of atomic orbitals into molecular orbitals, L-C-A-O-M-O, -O. linear combination of atomic orbitals into molecular orbitals. And so we're going to use that in order to construct some energy level diagrams. And so let's look at a few. Here's the first one. I want to, I want to do one that's going to show that uh, hydrogen, H2, is favored over atomic hydrogen. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to set up an energy level diagram. This is E equals 0, N equals infinity. And this is the ground state. This is the ground state, N equals 1. So this is the 1S. And I'm going to, just to be clear, this is the 1S atomic orbital in atomic hydrogen. And I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to put another one over here. Put another one over here. So here's two hydrogens. They both look the same. And then over here is H2. And by using LCAOMO, we can come up with the orbitals here. And you're not going to calculate these. This would be given to you. We would give you the energy levels and ask you to rationalize something that we're going to tell you is true. So what happens? Well, we have to use two other ideas. Superposition, we use the concept of conservation of states, conservation of states, and the Aufbau principle. So that includes Pauli exclusion principle, and includes the Hund rule, and so on. So let's look at the electron filling, first of all. This has a single electron, and since it's Friday, I think I'll even give it quantum numbers, one, zero, zero, a half. We only do this on Fridays, okay? And here's another one. It's over here, and its quantum address is one, zero, zero, a half. And you're saying, well, wait a minute. He's violated the Pauli exclusion principle. He's got two electrons here with the same set of quantum numbers, but these are two separate hydrogen atoms. They're not part of the same system. But now what we're going to do is we're going to bring them in together. We're going to bring them in together sort of along the lines of this. This cartoon shows here's the... Here's the uh, um, probability density function of 1s. And this is kind of nice because you see it's not an abrupt uh, spherical surface. What you see is a dot, a, a, a scatter plot, rather. And you see that the dot intensity grows as you get closer and closer to the center. So it tails off to infinity. So now here are these two isolated hydrogen atoms. And now they get close enough together that they start to sense 
that they're becoming part of one system. And once they start to become part of one system, poly exclusion principle kicks in. We start to have to conserve states. We can't have two 1s's sitting at the same level. And ultimately, we're going to get to this state where we're going to form a bond. So what happens is these two levels displace. One is a little bit higher, and one is a little bit lower than they are in the, uh, in the atomic uh, situation. And so this lower level is called a bonding. This is called a bonding orbital, and it's a bonding molecular orbital. And this one here, because it's at a higher energy, is called antibonding. It's antibonding molecular orbital. And these are S's. This is one S atomic orbital. This will be called sigma, lowercase sigma. And since it came from one S, it'll be called sigma one S. And I'm going to superscript it molecular orbital. And this upper one, to indicate that it's antibonding, has the asterisk. So this is sigma star the antibonding orbital that came from 1s, and it's a molecular orbital. So this is the energy level diagram of H2. So now let's put the electrons in. So how do I do it? I put in the first one spin up. I put in the second one spin down. I started with two electrons, one each from uh, two hydrogens, atomic hydrogens, and now I've got to fill this uh, molecular hydrogen. And so now the question is, is H2 stable? or will it not form? And the answer lies clearly in the energy difference. So what we do is we ask ourselves, what's the delta E? What's the energy change in going from two atomic hydrogens to one H2? Well, that's going to equal the energy of the electrons in H2 minus the energies of the electrons in H. And if this quantity is less than zero, it's favorable. The bonding is favorable. Well, we know it's favorable. Gone to the tables is 435 kilojoules per mole. That's, that's pretty favorable. So what, what's happening is that it turns out that the putting the electrons in that lower energy state is stabilizing that molecule. So that works. Oh, what about H2 plus? H2 plus, what would that look like? H2 plus would take one electron out. Would H2 plus be stable? According to this energy level diagram, yes, H2 plus is stable, and it's observed in plasmas. OK, let's go on. Let's do a few more. Let's do a few more. I want to ask about helium. Okay, So let's start. Here's, here's the 0. This is energy 0. And here's 1s, atomic orbital for helium. Here's another 1s, atomic orbital for helium. And again, we'll split. So here's the antibonding. And here's the bonding. And in this case, I start with helium is 1s2. So each of the heliums has two electrons. So now let's go and fill the molecular states for the putative helium 2. I don't know if it exists yet or not. So let's go. We go 1, 2, 3, 4. So now, helium 2, stable or not? Stable or not? Well, it's going to depend upon whether this delta is greater than this delta. In other words, if the rise in instability is greater than the fall in stability, this is a positive delta E. And it turns out that that's the case. It turns out that the antibonding orbital is a little bit higher from the atomic orbital level than the bonding orbital is lower. And so the result is that the delta E in this case, delta E in going from the atomic states to the molecular states is greater than zero, and so HE2, unstable, unstable. So I would, I would ask you to see how such energy level diagrams rationalize what we know to be true. I don't expect you to start with one of these and then predict what's going to happen. I would say, uh, with the aid of an energy level diagram, explain the fact that helium is found as uh, atomic gas and not um, Molecular. OK. Uh, how about this one? What about HE2 plus? What would that one look like? HE2 plus. For HE2 plus, there'd be one electron missing. And what do you see here? You have two electrons at much lower energy. You have one electron at a higher energy. And so in fact, the delta here is negative. 
and HE2 plus is observed in plasmas, observed in helium plasmas at high pressure, at high pressure, but not neutral HE2. Don't see those because it's just not in the cards. Okay, let's do one more because I'm having a ball. I don't know about you, but this is so fun. Let's do one more. Let's do lithium. Let's do lithium. So again, you know the drill. You're going to have, here's 1S atomic, but li lithium has 2S1. So I need a 2S atomic orbital here. And likewise over here, here's 2S atomic orbital. Here's 1S atomic orbital. So this is lithium, lithium. And this is all gas phase. Right? These are single atoms. It has to be gas phase. And now let's use the same principle. So here's sigma star, sigma sigma star and sigma. So these are the bonding and antibonding. The, the, the lower ones come from 1s and the upper ones come from 2s. So let's look at the electron filling in lithium. 1, 2, 3. 2s2, excuse me, 1s2, 2s1 over here. Same thing, 1s2, 2s1 because these lithiums are independent. Now what if they get close enough together to start forming one system? Let's fill. So what do we get? 1, 2, 3, 4, five, six. What's the conclusion? This indicates that by combining two lithiums, the energy of the combined system is lower than the energies of the atomic systems. So dilithium, dilithium is stable, is stable. And in fact, this is the case for all the alkali metals. So when you go down the highway and you look up and you see those sodium vapor lamps, the sodium vapor exists as the dimer, Na2. So this is, this is good. Dilithium state. Okay, good. So far we've looked only at the formation of single atoms, well, single bonds. Well, let's look at multiple bonds. Let's try nitrogen. We know nitrogen bonds, multiple bonds. Let's look at nitrogen. How would that look? Well, first of all, let's look at the... Uh, Let's look at the Lewis structure. Lewis structure for nitrogen 2 is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Here's the second nitrogen, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So here's octet for the left, octet for the right. We see three bonding pairs, so this is a triple bond, indeed a multiple bond. The bond is the electron pairs. And this is homonuclear, and so these are nonpolar, aren't they? They're perfectly shared between the two nitrogens. And furthermore, to uh, put the background in front, let's do the electronic structure. It's 1s2, 2s2, 2p3. So that would be 1, 2, 3, 4, hundrule, 5, 6, 7. Three unpaired electrons in nitrogen. Oh, by the way, look at this. I wasted your time here. I was supposed to apologize to you. Do you see? We learn nothing from examining what's going down, uh, on down here in n equals 1 shell. Right? It's filled here, it's filled here. We learn nothing. Let's take this whole thing and throw it away. So what's the lesson here? If you want to understand whether compounds form or not, look only at the valence shell. It doesn't make any sense. This is another example, it's sort of another thing that comes out of that analysis. You can see that there's no value in studying inner shell electrons to uh, ask questions about uh, bonding. Okay, so what do, these, what do these look like? These are p orbitals, and what's a p orbital look like? It's this dumbbell shape, right? That's what a p orbital looks like. And I got three of them. You know from the m quantum number, there's three. They're orthogonal. So what's that look like? Well, so I've got, here's, a, here's one, here's two, and here's three. All right, and I'll put, put a second one next to it. One, two, Three, excuse my drawing, but you know this is what we get on the. And the convention is that when two uh, atoms bond, they bond along the z-axis. So the convention will be that the z is uh, moving from uh, left to right, and so then the right-hand rule will kick in, and so the right-hand rule will kick in and require that you start with the thumb as x, and then you move to y and z, and so if that happens, this will be x into the board, y will be uh, the vertical, um, and Z will be moving to the right. So what we want to do is ask ourselves what happens when these two interact. 
And here's what it looks like. Here's what it looks like. I'm going to do it first pictorially, and then I'll, I'll write the algebra. So what happens here? We have two of them on the z-axis like this. These are both z-axis. So this is, this is 2pz atomic orbital plus 2pz atomic orbital. And they react to form something that smears in this manner. It's going to smear in this manner and will look something like this. Where I have dumbbell shapes with smearing. And this is now sigma of 2pz. And why did I call it a sigma? The sigma bond, sigma bond is characterized by continuous, continuous electron density between nuclei. We say there are no nodes, no dropouts, no holidays, no nodes. So you can start from one nucleus and go to the next nucleus, and there's no zero planes, no, no nodes, nothing. And the same thing that happens over here. What's this one going to look like? Here, here you would have, here's a 2s, here's a 2s, and when the two of them smear, we end up with something that looks like this. So here's the sigma. Again, we have continuous electron density from one nucleus to the other. So that gets us the first one. What's, what are the other two going to do? The other two have to do something different. The other two are going to smear laterally. So let's look at uh, 2PY. 2PY is vertical. So here's one of the, this is a 2PY atomic orbital. And it will react with a second 2PY atomic orbital. But it's not going to be able to give me sigma. Because already I can see there's a line of sight from one nucleus to the other with no electron density whatsoever. So these two are going to smear laterally. They will smear to give something that looks like this, where the, here are the two nuclei. And the upper, these are called lobes. This is a lobe. So I have two lobes in a p orbital. And that zero point is the node. The node is the same thing you see in a string, point of absolute rest in a vibrating string. We call a node. This is the same idea. And how do you get from one side to the other? You're vibrating. You're acting as a wave. That's how you get from one side to the other. OK, so the two lobes smear, and I end up with something that looks like this. And so the, the, both of these lobes, both lobes together uh, constitute a pi bond, a pi bond. And this will be called pi of 2py molecular orbital. And so it has what? In contrast to the sigma, it has a nodal plane, nodal plane, containing both nuclei, containing both nuclei. So let's take a look at some of these. So first of all, here's the, uh, this is the two uh, s, uh, s orbitals in uh, hydrogen, 1s plus 1s smearing to give us this sigma molecular orbital. And this one, just for uh, completeness, this is what the uh, antibonding orbital would look like. Where are we getting these again? We're getting these by plotting the values from the Schrodinger equation. You get these plots by taking the wave function times its complex conjugate and operating on that. That's proportional to probability. So these functions are what are being plotted. And there's a proportionality between that and where we expect the electron to reside, say that might be the contour of 99% of the time. There's a 1% chance it's beyond, but the 99% surface is spherical. All right, so here's from your textbook, same idea. 1s plus 1s gives you this oval uh, ellipsoid, which is the bonding, and here are the anti-bonding, and then these are the energy levels that I've been drawing for you. Now, here's the, uh, from your book as well, this is the PZs of the uh, two atomic orbitals forming the bonding orbital. You can see the, this is sort of P-like, but smeared. And then the anti-bonding, which we don't care about. And this is the lateral smearing. This is the, they call it X. Uh, I chose this, the vertical direction is Y. And just to give you a sense, if you do a cross cut of this, it, it should really look, you can't show it from this angle, but it should really be sort of a dumbbell shaped with the nodal plane in between the two nuclei. 
Oh, so now let's, let's go and do the energetics. We can, we can do the energetics on this one now. Uh, let's look at it. So you would be given this filling sequence, all right? What do you see here? This is now for nitrogen. There's the 2S. Why are we not looking at 1S? Because it's not the valence shell, so forget about it. So we're only looking at 2S and 2P. So here's the atomic nitrogen, here's the atomic nitrogen, and these are the orbitals of molecular nitrogen. So this is just the ladder. Now we're going to put electrons on the shelf here. So let's add them. So nitrogen, we start with 2S2, 2P3. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 5 and 5 is 10, so 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. Look at that. When you're done, you have three electron pairs in bonding orbitals. That's a good, solid triple bond. That's a triple bond. So what's it look like up here? What it looks like up here, the, the, uh, the simple Cartesian model of it is, these things smear this way. So there's a sigma orbital, and they're smearing this way. That's one pi orbital. So there's one sigma, one pi, and there's a second pi. And that's how we're getting the triple bond. N is one sigma and two pi. All right, so that's, there they are right here. So you can see that uh, on this one. And so it gives us a whopping 946 kilojoules per mole. That's a lot of energy because it's a really solid bond. Now, here's oxygen, oxygen and fluorine, and it's just a little bit different, and I draw attention to it. See, we would tell you the filling sequence, but I just want you to see that there are some subtle differences here that in the case of oxygen and um, uh, fluorine, the, the p orbitals, uh, the sigma and the pi, flip-flop. See that? But we would tell you the sequence. So let's go through it now. So this is oxygen. So oxygen's got six valence electrons, six. Six plus six is 12. So just as in nitrogen, we get two, four, six here, but now we've got two more electrons. And because of the way those antibonding orbitals are stacked, the two electrons go one each into those antibonding. So at the end of the day, you have some unpaired electrons. You have two electrons and antibondings kind of offset the bonding. And so the double bond is 498. 498. Remember, the other one was 960. And now here's fluorine, same, same skeleton, only fluorine has um, seven valence electrons. So we have uh, seven, seven is 14. So you can see that there's going to be two sets in antibonding, three sets in bonding for a net of one giving us the single bond, and it's only 160 kilojoules per mole. So this energy level diagram helps us understand the relationship between uh, electron filling and bond strength. It's very nice, very nice. Oh, and one last thing, because these things are unpaired, we've already seen how unpaired electrons play a role in the stern gerlach experiment. Here, this leads to paramagnetism, because there's some mutual induction. Both of these are spinning, but they're spinning in the same in the same uh, level. And so what happens is the result is paramagnetism. Uh, liquid oxygen is paramagnetic. And what can happen is that uh, this cartoon shows that if you put a magnetic field on uh, liquid oxygen, the liquid oxygen will be drawn towards the magnetic field. And in fact, you, if you take the jaws of a powerful magnet and pour liquid oxygen in between the jaws, the oxygen will stop and will sit in the jaws. Of course, it's evaporating like crazy because it's so, so uh, uh, warm in the room, whereas liquid nitrogen just goes zooming right through. So this is a, a consequence, again, of knowing the electron filling. Well, uh, let's, let's see something really crazy with uh, uh, electronegativity. This one I learned about in my own research about uh, 20 years ago, and it never ceases to amaze me. If you look at the electronegativity difference for sodium iodide, it's 1.73. And everybody would agree that's an ionic compound. Sodium is a metal. Iodine is a nonmetal. Look at cesium. Cesium versus gold is the same delta electronegativity difference. So they're both metals, cesium and gold. When you melt them, cesium melts at about 28 degrees centigrade. Gold melts at 1063. Liquid metal. You know, solid metal melts, becomes a liquid metal, like mercury, all right? But when the concentration in the alloy is 50-50 by mole, something magical happens. You have equal numbers of donors and acceptors. Electron transfer occurs. And you have this liquid alloy at 600 degrees centigrade, and it turns into a molten salt. It just goes bang, clear and colorless. Because salts are colorless, right? High band gap materials. 
The electrical conductivity plummets about three orders of magnitude, and instead of being an electronic conductor, a liquid metal, it's an ionic conductor. It's cesium oride. And if you cool that, it crystallizes in the form of a salt. A salt. You start with liquid metal, one. Liquid metal, two. You've got the ion ratios proper. Excuse me, the atom ratios proper. They mix, electron transfer occurs, and poof, it's clear and colorless. Sorcery. <laughs> All right, have a nice weekend.